Hi, this is Jay Gosquico with RawSavage.com, and in this episode, Swiftwater Rescue, what every river kayaker, river rafter, and any rescuer should know about the river. There are five counterintuitive things, so I'll touch base on all of them. I just wanted to introduce to you first my friends Julie Munger and Abby Posner at SierraRescue.com for definitive instruction in Swiftwater Rescue. And of course, Bobby Foster at fostercalm.com and or my friend Jim Bittner at Lake Tahoe Community College. They all teach, uh, Bobby and Jim teach wilderness medicine and Julie teaches, Julie and Abby teach swift water rescue and high and low angle um, coursework with uh, Rescue 3 International and CRRescue.com. All right, let's jump in. First of all, I want to introduce to you the river and waterfalls travel backwards in time. And so from a geological point of view, water comes down and crashes in and what you'll have is a caving in of the rock layer and as that caves in, the face of the waterfall caves in and this waterfall geologically speaking will travel backwards in time. All right. And the next thing I wanted to impart was that the river water is kind of like my zen. Um, water wants to be moving in one fluid motion going down river. So if this was the river flow going from right to left and if you take a rock and you put it in the middle of the river, some of the water has to speed up to get around that rock. And when that water speeds up to get around that rock and that rock disappears, the water has to slow down again after the rock, after it passes the rock. That slowing down is diminishing its energy from the speeding up. So sometimes that's two-dimensional and you, what you'll see is an eddy. Sometimes it's three-dimensional and what you'll see are standing waves and sometimes it's uh, dynamic, it's three-dimensional, um, and it's a, it forms a whirlpool. And so you'll see holes in the river. So anyway, um, that's my Zen talk. Water wants to be moving in one fluid motion, and if you put any obstacles in the way, some of the water needs to speed up, and then when that obstacle is, um, is done, some of the water needs to slow down. The other thing, as far as energy dissipation, is um, water is going to use itself, as I told you with the eddies and the standing waves, to diminish, um, and gravity, to diminish its energy. So in the ocean, the waves move, but the water stays in the same spot. Throw a tennis ball in and they'll know. Um, and in the river, the water moves, but the waves stay in the same spot. So you'll see the same wave, and we call them standing waves in the river. Okay, so that's your introductory, and I just wanted to jump into the five counterintuitive things that you'll see on the river. Um, the first one is a high side, and we'll pretend that this is the river flowing from left screen to right, and this is your raft, and it's coming across a rock, the purple dot is a rock, and as your raft comes up to the, the rock, a uh, high side is everybody puts their body weight on the rock side. That means everybody's head goes to the rock side so that the body weight of, the, of everybody drives that side down and you glance off the rock. So that's counterintuitive because most of us, when we see a rock, we want to go away from the rock. We want to back off from the rock. But in the river, what you want to do when your guide calls out a high side command, or if you're in a kayak, you want to lean toward the rock side so that your body weight pushes down on that side that's going to hit the rock and then you 
are able to glance off of it. Okay, so that's your high side. Know that. Um, the second counterintuitive thing is your swimmer's position. Your swimmer's position is feet downstream with your toes up so that you're looking through your toes. And really important that you put all your body weight on your PFD and you're not sitting up so that your butt's not um, hitting rocks at the bottom of the river. Also, because of river flow, the slowest portion of the river is, um, is the very top part of the river, where the, there's a lot of friction with the air above. The second slowest part, part is hitting the rocks down at the bottom, or actually the slowest part of the river is hitting the rocks at the bottom, creating small little areas here. The fastest part of the river is kind of in the middle, right here. So that's your uh, helical and lamellar flows are going in the middle of the river. And if you drop your butt down there, you will start going faster down river. So you don't want to, you want to keep your butt really high up in the surface. And if you drop your feet down here where it's uh, slow moving, what will happen is the rest of the river will want to roll you forward. So as your feet get slower in this current, and this laminar helical flow um, catches your body, you will begin to get rolled over forward. So effective if you're going into an aggressive swimmer's position, but very ineffective if you're trying to stay in a passive swimmer's position. So the universal and the more passive swimmer's position is flat on your back, putting your body weight on your PFD, which is California for life jacket, and looking through your toes. You want your toes way up here, nowhere near the rocks at the bottom. Okay? That's how you get in trapped. So, swimmer's position, second counterintuitive thing, keep your butt up. Um, crests and troughs. I told you about the standing waves. On the river. And since we're air-breathing land mammals, what we want to do is we want to wait till we get to the top of the wave in order to take a breath in. So we want to take a breath in at the top of the wave. It's just instinctual for us. The problem is your PFD, your, your life jacket, only works in the water. It doesn't work in the air. And the top of this is white water. In fact, we call them haystacks because they do look like haystacks. The top of this is white water. Your PFD doesn't float you up there. So in reality, your head never gets up to the top. Your head only gets to here. And you never get that breath of air at the top. So time to breathe is down here. That's my guy wearing a cap. The time to breathe is, uh, is right here in the trough. In the, in the bottom of the wave, which is counterintuitive because we want to wait till we get up here to breathe, but we never get up there because your PFD and your paddle only work in the water. It doesn't work in the air. So this is also the reason why a lot of you guys who are practicing your kayak rolls, they work in the pool because there's no white water in the pool, but if you're using your paddle too much as a leverage to push off, then when you get into the white water, you lose it. You lose your combat roll and you um, only have a pool roll. So get, get better with, uh, with your uh, rolling technique using your body instead of using your paddle. All right. Strainers. Whew. Now this is super serious and by the time you're getting into class four, uh, river running, then you'll want to take a swift water rescue class um, to uh, avoid strainers and or to mitigate strainers. Now, first of all, strainers generally happen in the upper elevations or in um, springtime when there's a lot of erosion and runoff from fresh uh, either snow or fresh rain. So you'll want to watch out if you're doing a lot of creek running in the springtime. 
If you're below the dam, it's less likely, but still in the springtime, got to watch out. A lot of times uh, logs will go over a uh, dam and go downstream even though there's a reservoir. Okay, so <coughs> strainers. Basically, what happens is a tree will fall down into the river and then all the heavy branches will, gravity will take all the heavy branches down and what you see is a smooth log and you might even see slow moving water in front and behind that log but what's happening is all that water is going through the strainer right and it's getting strained like a colander it's going to allow the water to go through but it's not going to allow you to go through so which brings me to Bernoulli um, Bernoulli the Wright brothers figured out what Bernoulli was saying and basically what Bernoulli was saying is if you take a uh, shape of anything in this case let's make it wood or metal and you make the top side a little longer than the bottom side and you take air and you push it through what happens is the feeding air going over the top will suck the wing up into the sky and that wing will always fly so uh, the Wright brothers figured this out and created a uh, an airplane called Kitty Hawk. Well, they flew it at Kitty Hawk and then subsequently called it Kitty Hawk. And what does that mean to a raptor? Well, remember that scenario where I said there was a big rock and your raft was going towards it? Well, as soon as your raft stops, there's more water going under your raft than above it and your raft starts getting sucked down. So that's why we jump on the high side and we glance off. Well, if you're going through, if all this water is coming through a tree and all of a sudden you stop, what happens is there's going to be a lot more water going underneath you than above you and you get sucked down. No bueno. So strainers are to be avoided at all costs. And if you can't avoid it, you should have already taken a swift water rescue class telling you how to avoid, um, uh, uh, how to mitigate going into a strainer. Okay, um, so that's the reason why a lot of people that you'll hear on the news, they died in with their hands sticking up out of the water because as you hit this, you get sucked down and um, you'll get sucked down to there's equal amounts of water going above you and below you. So it's a no bueno situation. You don't want to get stuck with your hand up here and your head underwater. Uh, void strainers at all costs. Um, again, strainers are more common in the springtime with runoffs, with floods, flash floods, and also um, with novices. So be, be careful. And rescuers, Please do not go after someone who um, by yourself without uh, upstream, downstream safety and knowledge from your swift water rescue classes. Okay, uh, shore, the very last part, not, um, not too critical, but that's generally where most people get hurt because they survive everything else. You get to the shore, you're mostly embarrassed, you're somewhat cold, and you're probably tired. And so the first thing you want to do, and it's very intuitive, is get up and get out of that situation, right? You don't want to be cold, embarrassed, and tired at the same time. But when you do get to shore, I want you to crawl all the way out until you're ankle deep in water. Because the reason is all these rocks are slippery and it's very easy for your foot to get caught in these rocks causing an entrapment the rest of that water is going to push on your back or on the back of your thighs and then your butt and back and it'll launch you forward and you'll get your foot entrapped between the rocks. It'll get anchored in there while you, your head hits the ground and you become a fishing lure going downstream. So um, avoid doing that. Okay, 
So let's review that real quick. High side is your head and body weight towards the rock. If the rock's here, I want my head and body weight towards the rock. Swimmer's position flat with all of your weight on your PFD. In the crest and trough, you want to breathe at the trough, at the bottom, not at the top. And strainers, avoid strainers. Just no bueno situation, avoid strainers. Now that's different than reeds at the side of the river or grass at the side of the river. Strainers suck you down, grass just kind of annoys you and gets in the way and scratches you up a little bit. Um, shore, and then of course getting the shore crawl all the way up and out of the shoreline. Okay, I know it uh, doesn't sound like Baywatch, but um, life's not a lot about Baywatch when you're trying to survive. Okay, so anyway, uh, Swiftwater Rescue, take a, take a class with Julie Munger, uh, one of three women who self-supported on boogie boards 21 days on the Grand Canyon. Freaking amazing. And she's teaching Swiftwater Rescue classes out here in Northern California. So catch up with her. And then my friends Bobby Foster at fostercalm.com and Jim Bittner, who is a ski patroller and good friend of mine at Lake Tahoe Community College. And of course, Roz Savage, who I am uh, trying to promote, and the um, making of the 2012 London Olympics plastic bag free by signing the petition at the bottom of the screen. Okay, thank you so much, and mahalo, happy holidays, and be safe out there. Springtime is uh, kind of rocky, so uh, uh, be safe. Okay, see ya. Shaka. <laughs>